Today's sermon is entitled, God is our refuge and strength. The passage that I've chosen is Psalms 46, verses 1 to 3. My name is Reverend Derek Gilbert. I'm a senior pastor here at McKees Mills Baptist Church. I want to say thanks. You know what? We're going to learn an awful lot about what to do with our fear. The reality is it's not a very easy world to live in right now. There's a lot of tribulation, there's a lot of turmoil, and there's a lot of news stories that can instill fear in our hearts. And the question is, what do we do with that fear? How do we get rid of it? How do we feel unspeakable joy in God's presence? You know what? We can do that. And that's what this passage today is all about. So I hope that you get as much out of this sermon as I did in preparing it, and I hope and pray with all my heart that you don't hear my voice, And you don't even think about anything about me at all. You only think about God. You only think about the verses. You only think about how they relate to you and to me and how we can get close to God and feel peace that surpasses all understanding. But before I get into the sermon, i got a couple announcements. Number one, the Daily Bread. It is now available. It's April, May, and June for 2020. It's available at the church in large print. And number two, I've had quite a few people ask me, what do I do with my offering? Now, of course, you can send it to the treasurer if you know the person's email, their address, their uh, postal code address. You can send it to the church, and the address is on the website. That's a possibility. Or if you really want to be secure, you can bring it inside of the church on Saturday. It will be open. I'll be here. You can pass it in. There's a little uh, basket right by the coffee table. Just drop it in there, and later on, the treasurer will come and pick it up and take it with her. Now, I'm still working. And I fully understand what the six-foot rule is, and I do practice it very well. So you can come into the church. I will say hi to you, but I'll keep my distance, and we'll both keep safe. So you don't have to worry about that whatsoever. So I wanted to pass those announcements on because I know I'm starting to get quite a few questions about both of these particular areas. Let's look at the scripture in question today. Let's see what we have. It's coming up here on the screen. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth will give away and the mountains may fall into the sea, though the waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their struggling, we will not fear. We will not fear. I have this quote. It's from Charles Spurgeon. He says, If indeed the Lord be our refuge and strength, we are entitled to seek after a spirit which shall bear us above the dreads of common men and women. When the tides of tribulations come roaring into one's life and our men lose all their hope in future and in purpose, you'll surely watch them die a slow death in front of you. Charles Spurgeon. Wow. Spurgeon always has really profound and provocative statements to say. But ultimately, I think this world really needs hope right now. While humanity's always been worried, and I think we always have been, the way in which the world might, might end. You know what? You can get, go online at any time. You can go to Netflix and find all sorts of movies about how does the world end or how could it possibly end. And there's lots of different ways that the movies will give us. Maybe it's global warming that's going to be our demise. Maybe it's going to be an asteroid that's going to hit the earth and that's going to wipe us out. Maybe it's going to be some kind of engineered disease and everyone's going to die from it. Maybe it'll be nuclear war, or maybe it'll be overpopulation, or some even suggest maybe robots will get artificial intelligence and eventually they'll take over the entire world. But I don't think any of those things, those movies and those concepts, instill fear in us far as much as having to live with an inescapable threat in your own personal life. In other words, it's one thing to talk about abstractly something that might hurt us. It's another thing to live through something, especially if you have it like a disease or you have financial problems or you have marital problems or you have this virus that's out there. These are things that are actually very close to home. And that instills even more fear than a hypothetical. When the worldly solutions of money, fame, and power and creativity of one's mind fail to provide the means to escape, Where do you go to find rest for your soul? Where do you go to get rid of that fear? Where do you go to find peace of mind? During the dark and dangerous periods of the Reformation, Martin Luther found in Psalms 46 the answer to that question. And of course, as Christians, we know exactly where we should go. Our refuge is found in the Lord. 
A sense of nearness and graciousness of God is the antidote to fear. For in His sovereignty, He promises not only to do good to those that actually love Him, but to grant them strength, to grant us endurance, to grant us peace that's going to surpass anything we could ever imagine. I got wondering about that verse. Now, why is that true? What does God mean here when he says, I will give you peace that surpasses understanding? And if you dig into scriptures, the answer is God will give us his peace. Can you imagine? God giving us divine peace so that we might feel rest in tribulation. While non-believers might see, might not necessarily see the logic in having faith in one that you cannot absolutely see, Though saints might get perplexed, 2 Corinthians 4, 8 to 12, they need not fear any peril because we can always run to our Heavenly Father in Heaven and we will find divine protection, we will find divine strength, and we'll find, we'll find refuge, incredible refuge. The following sermon is going to focus first on where we shouldn't go. The world has all sorts of ways that we can find peace in turbulent times, but those ways don't always work. Matter of fact, most times they do not. We're going to talk about that first. And the second thing we're going to talk about is what does God's refuge look like for us? How do we get that? How do we get that peace that we really need right now? So when you turn on CNN, for instance, and you start watching this show, and you notice that there's a whole bunch of news about a whole bunch of people unfortunately getting sick, and they're dying from this virus, and you're feeling that. You're you're saying, look, the virus is in my neighborhood too, and you're starting to get scared. How do you get God's peace and not feel fear? How do you do that? So we're going to talk about that. But first and foremost, I want to talk first about the false way that we can try to get peace. The way that's just not going to work. For many people in this world, security against the unknown comes from acquiring a whole bunch of earthly stuff. To ensure against tribulation, many people acquire fat bank accounts, they'll acquire lush stock portfolios, or they'll acquire all sorts of tangible assets. Thinking to themselves, you know what, if I got lots of stuff and I got lots of money, I can buy my way out of just about any problem at all. Well, there's some truth to that, some, but reality is, is there are many things that come our way that money simply cannot buy us out of. Others will find security, though, in offering or obtaining specialized skill set or personal talents that are in high demand. So they sit back and say, you know what? I'll never be out of work. I'll always have work to do. I'll always be in high demand. I will always have the highest paying jobs. And when, and, and it's also true that some people will find that security in other places. Some people it's in business relationships. Some people it's in friends. Some people find their security in family. These are other places. But you know, for the world, we live in a fairly cruel world to a certain extent, and some people actually find their security in their ability to steal, to take, to break down, to divide, destroy, and disintegrate those people who are not as strong as they are. Whatever the case may be, the Bible says all of these things I just talked about are foolish. They don't matter. They're not going to work. They're just not. The Bible says only a fool would seek after such earthly things as security for an unknown future because they're only temporary. And they're only able to protect oneself against some tribulations for for the majority of the tribulations in life. Not necessarily so. No amount of money, no specialized training, no privileged relationship can ensure against heartbreak, against failure, against sin, against disease, against worldly disasters such as this coronavirus. None of those things are going to help us. And in the parable of the rich fool that you see up on this screen, remember where it said, I'm going to build bigger farms, this guy said. You know, I'm going to build great big barns and farms, and I'm going to fill them right up to the gills, and then I'm going to have lots of stuff, and then I'm just going to lay on my laurels and just enjoy life. Well, God said to this this fellow here, Jesus says, you know what? The reality is, is that, hey, this is foolishness, because one day you're going to die. And the moment that you die, you're going to face God for judgment. And you're not going to take your money with you. And you're not going to have any of that earthly security when you get in front of a holy God and he asks, what did you do with your life that I gave you? So here's the first thing. The world has a way of giving us security, but it's not a way that ultimately works. It doesn't guarantee that we can handle the unknown future without any fear. Definitely not. 
So that's the things that don't work. Now let's talk a little bit about refuge. Refuge, true refuge and true peace is found in God. We will never know what true strength and peace is until we believe in and trust that God oversees everything and absolutely anything in life. Luther stated the reason why he sang Psalms 46 when he faced tribulations was because God is with us and powerfully and miraculously preserves, defends his church against everything, against fanatical spirits, against the gates of hell, against the impeccable hatred of Satan, and against every single assault this world ever goes against the church. Guess what? God protects the church and his people. That's why Martin Luther, every time that he started feeling some fear, every time that he got into a situation where he said, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to go through all sorts of perils, he went to God because he said, in my God, I find security. True peace of mind does not arise from one's own personal self-sufficiency, but is freely granted to God's children when they draw nearer to his presence, James 4.8. While it is true that God is indivisibly present absolutely everywhere, Psalms 139, the problem isn't that God isn't near us. The problem is, is that we won't draw near to Him. We spend so much of our time trying to live the ways of this world and walking away from God that we don't feel His presence. He's still there. We're just not. We're not willing to bow our knee. We're not willing to say, Lord, help me. We're not saying, Lord, I want to obey you. We're too busy chasing the things of this world. God's word and God's ordinance are rivers and streams which God makes his saints glad in dark, cloudy days. The gentle whisper of his voice can calm the most fiercest storms of fear raging in our hearts. If only we would stay still, Psalms 46.10. If only we would learn to pray and obey God, we would no longer store treasures up here on earth as insurance, but instead we would rejoice. We would rejoice that it is our faith in God that matters. It's our faith that God has our future and He knows what it is. You know what? There is an unknown future for the people who don't believe in God, absolutely. But for the people who do believe in God, our future is known. We're going to go to heaven. We're going to spend an eternity with God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in heaven and we're going to spend in the Garden of Eden talking and walking with them again just like Adam and Eve did. We know what our future is. There is no doubt. And it's fully secured in the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we have incredible hope, by the way. True refuge ultimately must be certified, though, by experience. Now, what I just told you is all 100% true. It all came from the Bible. But here's the thing. While I may know something to be true, that doesn't necessarily mean that my heart's going to grab a hold of it and say, yes, I believe it. Yes, I understand it. Yes, it's driving out fear, that knowledge. To truly know that God is our refuge in times of trouble, one merely needs to certify this divine reality with our past experiences. In other words, we've got to look at all the times that God has saved the people in the Bible and all the times that God has saved us in the past, and we've got to sit back and say, God is is good in our weakness actually we find god's strength is personified in our lives the most with jehoshaphat i'll give you a couple examples when jehoshaphat he faced an invincible army it was coming at him and he realized oh my goodness these two armies are strong they are incredibly powerful they they were the moabites and the ammonites and they wanted to wage war so they ganged together and they said let's go let's go get jehoshaphat let's go attack and off they went And, of course, he is absolutely petrified. He's scared. And as a result, Jehoshaphat and the entire nation said, you know what, we're going to get on our hands and knees. And they declared a fast. And they said, let's pray to God. Let's cry out to him, Lord, we need your help. Lord, we don't know what to do. Lord, our future looks like it's in great jeopardy and great peril. Lord, would you not help us? The reality is that Judah, the nation that I'm talking about, got to watch The two nations, Moabites and the Ammonites that were coming to destroy them, they got to watch God create a quarrel between the two of them and they decimated themselves. They attacked each other. Judah didn't have to fight at all because God said, the battle is mine. I will fight for you. You can sit. You can watch. This is mine. It's my battle. And I will win the battle. And he did. I got thinking about... 
Hezekiah. And uh, Hezekiah, he had a similar situation. Here he had the Assyrian army that was coming after him. Now this was a really big army. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, so I'm just going to gloss over some of the details. But you had this really big army. And they were massive. They were huge. And they were going all throughout the lands. And they were decimating every place they went to. Nobody could stand up amongst their might and their power. You have the commander and he shows up. And, and here you have Hezekiah. And, and this commander shows up and he looks at Hezekiah from outside the walls and he said, oh, by the way, don't trust in your God. He can't save you. He's not going to help you. We attacked a whole bunch of cities and they told us the exact same thing you are. They told us, you know what? Our God is big and our God is powerful and our God's going to save us and you're not going to be able to defeat us because our God will come and fight for us. And the commander yelled out to Hezekiah and said, you know what? You're foolish because we destroyed every one of those cities and their gods. We're going to do the same to you, by the way. So Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah prayed to God fervently and asked him for help. And again, they said the same thing. Our future is in jeopardy. We've got a really big problem, God. We don't know what to do, and we need your help so very much. And in the same case, God fought for them. God was the one who showed up. God sent his angel, it says, and 185,000 of them were destroyed by that angel. They didn't have to fight at all. That's amazing. While our trials are all different, while our testimonies of our past experiences that we've had in life in which God has saved us are all different, hopefully you can say all of our testimonies would ultimately be the same. I had a problem. I prayed to God. God came and God helped me with my problem. He did what I could not do and nobody else could do. He saved me. We've got to remember these stories. We've got to remember that our strength has been made perfect in our weakness. Ironically, says Spurgeon, our happiest hours are not on the mountaintops of blessings, but in the valleys of tribulations when the waters are bitter and the cup of divine consolation is all the sweeter. Has there ever been a trial in your life, ever, that you've cried out to God and say, look, God, as you can see in the picture, I'm hanging from a thread. I'm not going to survive, God. I don't want to do, God. I'm scared and I'm frightened and I'm lonely. And God, I'm just, I'm so concerned and I'm so consumed with all this bad news that's going around. And God, I really need your help. Has he ever, ever said no? Has he ever not met with you and told you, this is what I'm going to do. I will strengthen you. I will perfect you. I will give you joy amidst this storm. I will save you. I've done it before. I will do it again. God doesn't always take us out of our trials and tribulations. I'm not saying that. And we know he doesn't. But he certainly does give us a strength to survive and to thrive in whatever conditions we face day in, day out. Because he is our God. He loves us greatly and we are his people. goes on and says that ultimately true refuge in God eliminates our fear. Is one thing, I think, to confess or to know that God is our refuge, like I said just a minute ago, but it's quite another, to bring to our hearts that feeling, that feeling of divine security, that feeling that God has us firmly in his hand and he's not going to let go and he's not going to let anybody ever touch us. Now, that's monumental. It's one thing to know something. It's another thing to believe it true and to accept it. Fear is often the companion of uncertainty, but even more so when the magnitude of one's calamities threatens one's own very life. In today's passage, the psalmist talks about this. He says, I want to think about the worst case scenario. You ever met somebody like that who thinks about the worst case scenario all the time? They're quite negative people, but that's not the psalmist here. The psalmist is thinking very joyfully. He's saying, you know what? I'm going to think of the worst possibility that could happen to me And then I'm going to say, my God is good. He said, you know what? Even if human existence was threatened with dissolution, even if it was to be thrown back into the pre-creation, chaotic waters, and they all rose really fast, and they didn't obey their boundaries that God set them, and they came up, and they grabbed a hold of the mountains, and they threw them in the sea. The psalmist says, I'll fear not. My God is with me. My God is near me. My God has always helped me and he will help me again. 
When we allow memories of past deliverances and immediate enjoyment of divine help flood into our souls, fear is swallowed up by our faith in God Almighty, a faith in our Creator, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. This kind of unshakable faith is attainable for any believer who not only remembers who God is, our sovereign Creator, but who God is to us, our refuge and our strength. Praise be to God that no calamity will separate us from the love of God that says, I have always known you. Psalms 139. I will never leave you, even when you experience trials and tribulations, and I will give you peace. Philippians 4, 7. No matter what happens, my children are joint hairs, God says, with Christ and will spend eternity with me in paradise. John 3.16 Because God is present as a refuge of his people, it is unreasonable, and I dare say maybe even a little bit sinful, for us to have fear. No, our God is big and wonderful and beautiful, and he's in charge. We don't need to fear anything. We don't need to. True refuge in God readies oneself for Satan's attacks, though. If you do the things that God tells you to do, especially in Psalms 46, and you have incredible faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to protect you, expect Satan to not like that very much. And he's not going to. If you become fearless through the presence of God, that courage is going to be tried. Masquerading as an angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11.14, Satan is more than capable of promoting doubt and fear into our very hearts. To the church of Ephesus, Apostle Paul wrote that we as Christians wrestle, not so much against people, we do that from time to time, but more we wrestle against the spiritual forces of this evil and dark world, Ephesians 6.12. Even though the devil has lost the battle for eternal destination, John 3.16, he is more than willing to instill terror into our hearts of those believers who are weak in the faith. Now, here's the reason why he does this. He wants to make sure we don't serve in God's kingdom. He wants to make sure of that. And the best way to keep a Christian from serving in God's kingdom, give them a whole pile of fear. And then they won't serve. They'll spend too much time cowering in fear and not enough time getting out and professing the good news of the gospel. That's a reality. Though the devil roars around like a lion looking to devour us, we are to fear no evil. For when we sit down in the middle of the storm and are still in the presence of he who is greater than the devil and all of his demons... The devil ain't going to touch us as long as we stay in the presence of the Lord. He has no power whatsoever. We can hear God's powerful voice in the greatest of our storms. Say this, you are secured. You are my child. I love you so very much. And beneath my wings you will find no one will ever touch you. No one will ever hurt you. No one will be able to penetrate my might and my love and my power for you. No one. Not a single person. You are safe under my wings. Despite Satan's attack of terror upon our minds, we can continue to feel peace that surpasses all understanding because our portion, Psalm 16, 5, is God whose plan is to do good to those that he ultimately loves. Romans 8, 28 is founded on an unmovable rock of our foundation. And that is Jesus. Nothing is going to move Jesus' love for us. Ironically, it is precisely in the trials and tribulations that believers find new grace and become even more certain of the truth that since God is for them, who could ever be against them? Who? Romans 8.31 May during our storms, may we strap on the armor of God and cry out to the Lord and say, The Lord liveth, blessed be my rock. Blessed be my rock. For I know He loves me. And he takes care of me. Blessed be my rock. Blessed be my rock. I want to say this. There's a great harvest of herding sheep out there. There's a lot of them. I want to tell you a story. It's a beautiful story from 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 to 23. It's about a prophet named Elisha. Now, God talked to Elisha. Of course, that's not surprising. He was a prophet. But there was a king that was out there. And then this king ultimately wanted to attack Israel, King Aaron. And he was trying to make war. So what he did is he would go inside of his bedroom. And you can only imagine, this is a king. So the king had a very nice bedroom, massive. And nobody else was allowed in the bedroom except for the king. So he's inside of his bedroom. 
And, of course, he brings in all of his officials, and he talks to them. He says, all right, let's make a plan. How are we going to attack Israel? How are we going to win the war? How are we going to fight against them? How are we going to be victorious? So they come up with this great plan. And, and of course, the officials would tell him, by the way, his officers would say, he's in such and such a place right now. Here's the best way to attack him at this place. Okay, the king said, I like your idea. Or the king came up with his own and said, all right, go attack him. So they went out, and their whole army went out and marched towards them. And when they got there, lo and behold, where was Israel? Nowhere to be found. So they come back a little bit flustered, and they tell the king, we couldn't find him. He's not there. He must have moved. Okay, of course, King Aram's getting a little bit flustered, too. But he goes back in his bedroom with his officials again and says, okay, let's make another plan. Where are they now? Well, they're over in this place now. Okay, fair enough. What's the best way to attack them in that place? And, of course, they discuss it and come up with another plan. So out they go, all the officials and all the army, and they march towards this location where Israel was supposed to be, where they were just a few days ago, and lo and behold, they're not there again. This happens two or three times. They come back and tell the king. Of course, the king at this point, he's not flustered anymore. He's just angry. He's bitter at this point. He pulls them all into his bedroom. And you can only imagine, his face is just scarlet red. He's very ticked off. And he looks at his officials and says, all right, let's get right down the brass tacks. Who's a traitor? One of you is telling every single plan that I'm making to Israel. Somebody is a rat here. I want to know who. Of course, what the king was really saying, if some of you, or one of you at least, doesn't speak up and say you're the rat, I'm going to kill you all anyway, because I want to make sure I get rid of this menace or this problem. What would you feel in that moment? That's certainly a tribulation that would be a little bit frightening. As the official, you'd probably be shaking in your boots. One of them actually does speak up. And, of course, he's feeling a little bit scared and a little bit timid. And I can just imagine him shaking a lot and saying, By the way, king, I hate to tell you this, but there's a prophet inside of Israel. And this prophet, Elisha, I don't know how, but he hears every single word you say right now inside of this bedroom, and he's sharing that with the king of Israel. Every word. And we don't have no idea how he's doing it. But he is. It must be his God. I guess that's helping him. Of course, Israel had a reputation of their God doing great and wonderful things. So the king Aram, he gets really mad and really bitter. And he says, all right, fair enough. You go find out where he is. Find me Elisha. So they go out and they look and they find him. They come back and they say, he's in the city of Dothan. He says, okay, this time, forget Israel for the moment. Send the army to Dothan. Send the whole army down there. Send the chariots, send the horses, surround that entire city. I don't care it's a small city. Make sure there's no way they get out. So they send the whole army down there. The army gets there. And here's where the story gets really interesting. They arrive at nighttime. They surround the entire city. And, of course, this city's no match for this huge, massive army. And, you know, this this servant of Elisha, who's in, they're just in a hut. He gets up in the morning and he looks out the window. And he sees all these chariots and all these horses. And he sees them all and he's petrified and he's scared. And I can only imagine he probably knocked on uh, Elisha's bedroom, you know, his door and said, Master, Master, I got a real big problem here. And of course, Elisha's looking at him and said, What's the problem? And he says, The king, King Aram, has sent his army here to get you. And it's not good. And we're not going to survive. And we're not going to live. And we're woe is to us. We're undone. We're done. And this is where the story is amazing. Elisha prays to God. and says, God, open his eyes that he might see. Open his eyes that he might understand what's really going on here. May he see truly your might and your power. God opened the eyes of the servant. And then Elisha said, oh, by the way, look out that window and you will see reality. And he looked out that window, and there was a vast army, God's army, in behind King Aram's army, that was filled with chariots and horses of fire. And they way outnumbered King Aram. And the sad part is, it's just one of God's army would have wiped completely Aram out. And he had this whole army around him. And I can tell you, this servant must have been just looking at Elisha going, our God is an awesome God. He's amazing. I think we need to see the reality. We need God to open our eyes so that we might know and understand that he is our God and we are his people and he loves us so very much. We have a whole world of people out there right now and they feel an awful lot of fear. A 
lot of fear. And we have the solution for that fear. And that is a relationship with God. I tell you this story to remind both you and me. There exists a great harvest of herding sheep in this world. An estimated two-thirds of the world are unsaved. And about 1.6 billion people have never heard about the Lord Jesus Christ. Despite this truth, only 1% of Christian income is spent trying to reach these unbelievers. Part of the problem lies in the fact that a staggering 51% of churchgoers do not know the Great Commission and 25% of believers, while they know what the Great Commission is, they don't know what it means. They don't understand it. When earthly solutions of money, fame, power, and the creativity of their minds fail to deliver this world from tribulations, terror fills their souls. The more distraught the situation, the more the world will look to the fearless Christians and ask, what do you have that I do not have? How come you are so peaceful? How come you are not being filled with fear? There must be a secret to why you feel so much peace. What amazing time it is to be alive, for during this pandemic, the whole world seeks to find security. In response to the crowds gathering to hear Jesus Christ, to receive his touch, to to receive some kind of peace from him, Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are very few. It's a wonderful and beautiful time to tell the world. You know, no longer able to stand on earthly means of escape, this world desperately is looking for deliverance, and we know the deliverer, and we have a message for them. In the comfort that you have already received, tell the world the reason why you have hope. My Jesus, who is my portion and my rock of my salvation, wants you to enter into his divine fellowship of security. He wants to heal your heart. He wants to drive fear out of your life. He wants you to feel joy unspeakable joy he wants to wrap his arms around you he wants to make sure that you feel security and safety as one of his children not somebody on the outside let us obey the great commission let us go out into this world and baptize people in the name of the father son and holy spirit let's go out into this world and tell them all about jesus christ and every word that jesus ever spoke because those words give life to this world and drive out fear from this world the Holy Spirit is awesome and amazing I want to leave you with this final quote and it's from John Piper he said I want to live my life in this age of massive misery and lostness so that when I die I can look up from my bed not with any pretense of perfection not with any illusions of my indispensability but with faith and hope in Jesus Christ as my Savior and I can honestly say I have glorified you, God the Father. I have glorified you on earth, having accomplished every little bit of work you gave me to do. Now I get to go home and see you. Is that not our prayer? Is that not the goal of our lives? To do whatever God wants us to. The storm is raging out there right now. No question. And a lot of people are really, really scared. They are frightened. They are frightened concerning their finances and they are frightened of this disease. There's no question. But the question for me is, what will we do about it? We have the cure to what really ails them. It's not a disease necessarily. Really what, cure, what, what disease they have that's the worst, it's not the coronavirus. It's sin. That's the disease they have that is the worst in their life. It's separation from God that's ruining them. And we have the solution. Come and ask Jesus Christ in your heart. Tell him how much you love him. Tell him that you need him. Tell him that you're sorry that you sinned against him. Make him the Lord of your life and he will enter into your soul and he will drive the fear away because you will be his child forever secured to go to heaven and be with him. Tell them they are loved deeply by God the Father, and he has not forgotten them. This is our message of hope. Look for every opportunity you get, every opportunity to tell the world, I love Jesus. And that's why I'm not scared of this virus. I'm not scared of life circumstances. I'm not even scared of death. Because my God has me in his hand, 
And he's always going to have me in his hand no matter what happens for an eternity. I will be in the presence of the Lord. And that's what this world needs to hear. Because they can be in the presence of the Lord from now and forevermore too. So find any opportunity you can to go out and tell them all about Jesus. Because I think that it's the greatest cure of all to what really ails them. Separation from God. I hope and pray that you stay safe. And I hope and pray that you stay in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope that you always turn to Him when you start to feel a little bit of fear and let Him drive that fear out. And just bask in His presence and His love because He really does care for you and for me. Praise be to God for that. Our God is an awesome God. So the song, I was hoping to play it, but I can't. Where will I go? I'll go to the Lord. I will go to the Lord and I will feel joy. Amen.